morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Topic for the day is going to be atmospheric circulation. So as always, let me get you your objectives, and we'll get going. By the end of this video, know or be able to do the following. First up, connect climate to ecosystem conditions. Second, describe each layer of the atmosphere. And finally, explain the connection between unequal heating of Earth's surface and atmospheric convection. Lots of things to cover today. We'll try to be quick. No guarantees, though. First thing that I kind of want to just say in general before we get going, this whole video is going to be about ways that climate is determined. So what are the things around the world, abiotic conditions that determine where rainforests are and where polar regions are and where tundra is, etc. So we're going to start talking about that stuff today. Before we get into it, though, I need to make just a quick uh, distinction between weather and climate. Weather is what is happening right now or in the next couple days. So you log onto your phone, you check your weather app, that's telling you what's going to happen over the next five to seven days. Weather is fairly difficult to predict. You can get a decent idea, but you're never going to get a dead on. This is how it's going to be. Climate, on the other hand, is the average of weather patterns over a long period of time, usually several decades. So what um, meteorologists will do is they will take the weather conditions for each day over like a 30-year period, average them all together, and that would be a description of the climate for an area. Now where weather is pretty unpredictable, climate is something that can be predicted and talked about with a fair amount of accuracy. And climate's also important to us because the climate of an area influences what the ecosystem in that area is like. Um, we're going to learn later on in the year that the thing that most determines what lives in an ecosystem is the amount of rain because that affects the plants. So if an area gets a lot of rain, then a lot of plants can grow, which means a lot of food for those lower levels of our trophic pyramid. If there isn't so much rain or precipitation, then it's a dry area, which means fewer plants and fewer animals. So the amount of rain and the temperatures in an area, the climate of an area, is going to influence what plants are able to live in an area, and the plants influence what animals are able to live in an area. Now before we get into the actual nuts and bolts of determining climate, I need to do a quick review with you about layers of the atmosphere. We're going to talk about these a lot, and I just want to make a couple notes on this little diagram here. So your layers of the atmosphere are as follows, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and then up here you've got the exosphere. And there are many ways that you can remember these in order. Um, one that I have heard is the soccer mom throws eggs. That could be one way to remember it. Here's a couple points on each one. First thing you need to know is that gravity pulling downward on air molecules is the thing that keeps our atmosphere in place and it's the thing that separates it into layers. So if you look right here, this is kind of showing you the pressure, which is how closely packed together all of the air molecules are. When you are down near the surface of the Earth, you can see that our air molecules are very tightly packed together. That's because gravity is pulling them all together. And in that case, you've got high pressure. And then as you move up through the atmosphere, your pressure goes down. There's less gravity acting on the air molecules. And you can see right here, they're all spread out. So the more spread out the air molecules are, the lower the air pressure. The more packed together they are, the higher the air pressure. And the closer you are to the surface of the Earth, the higher the air pressure. Uh, a couple notes on each of the layers. First layer is the troposphere. Things you need to know about the troposphere is the layer that we live in, and it is the air, the layer where all weather occurs. So all of your weather happens in the troposphere, and that's where we live. Okay, next one up is the stratosphere. Big thing to know about the stratosphere is this is where atmospheric ozone hangs out. The reason we like ozone is because it absorbs UV radiation and keeps the UV radiation from harming us. You got the mesosphere. Big thing to know about the mesosphere is that it helps to absorb X-ray radiation so that we don't get X-rayed all the time. Thermosphere is the least dense layer of the atmosphere, and this is where the northern lights happen. And then exosphere is the boundary of space. Once you get to the exosphere, you are basically out into space. So I would recommend maybe rewinding this slide a bit because you are going to need to know some facts about each of these layers of the atmosphere, and you're going to need to be able to talk about them a little bit. 
The other thing that we need to know about the Earth when we're talking about determining climate is that the surface of the Earth heats unequally. Now this seems kind of like a duh statement, but we need to talk about the whys so that you can talk about the whys. Um, and there are basically three major reasons that the surface of the Earth heats unevenly. So I'm going to draw really quick. This is going to be our atmosphere around the Earth. And the Earth, which I hope you know, is tilted at 23 and a half degrees. So it's not like the Earth is straight up and down. It's tilted like this. Now let's say our sun is right here, sending rays to the Earth all day long. Now, at the equator, you can see that our sun's rays don't have to travel through that much atmosphere. They're just going from like there to there. And the reason that that's important is because as sun rays travel through the atmosphere, they lose some of their heat, which means that they will make the land less hot. So at the atmosphere, or at the equator, the sun isn't traveling through that much atmosphere, which means it doesn't lose that much heat. But over here, up towards the poles, you can see that this sun's ray has to travel through quite a bit more atmosphere just to get to where it's going. Because it travels through more atmosphere, that means that it's going to lose more heat, which means it's not gonna heat up the surface of the Earth as much. So this means at the equator, the air is gonna be a lot warmer than it is up in the north and south. Also, the curve of the Earth is important because right here, the solar energy that's coming in is gonna hit this Earth straight on and it's not gonna spread out very much. So it would just be like putting a magnifying glass right over, I don't know, an ant out in the sun and concentrating the solar energy. Over here, you can see that as the sunlight comes in, it's gonna hit the surface of the Earth and then it's gonna kind of spread out, which is gonna cause less heating. And then the last quality you need to know of that causes unequally heating is albedo. Albedo is essentially how shiny something is. So as that sunlight comes in, when it hits areas that are, let's say, deserts or dark forest right here, those areas are going to absorb the heat and hold it in. But when that sunlight hits, let's say something that is snow covered, like the poles, it's just going to reflect that heat right back out to space because snow is shiny, so it reflects the heat. So these three qualities right here are all going to determine which areas of the Earth are hot and which areas of the Earth are cold, which is going to be really relevant when we pair that up with some qualities of air that you need to know about. There's four properties of air you need to know about, and then we're going to tie all this up and talk about its relation to climate. Four properties of air that basically determine how it behaves and circulates around the world. The first thing that you need to know about air, the first quality of air that you need to know, is changes in density. And I mentioned this on the slide about the layers of the Earth or the atmosphere when I talked about pressure. The other thing you need to know about density is that as air heats up, it rises. Okay, so warm air is less dense, and so it rises. Cool air is more dense and it sinks. This is going to be really, really important in a second. So remember, warm air, less dense, so it rises. Cool air, more dense, it sinks. And the next thing that kind of ties into this hot-cold idea is vapor capacity. This is talking about how much water vapor can hang out in the air, basically how humid is the air. If it is warm, if the air is warm, then it has high vapor capacity, which means that warm air holds a lot of water vapor. So this is why, you know, in the summer here in North Carolina, it gets really humid because that air is warm and it can hold a lot of water vapor. Cool air doesn't hold very much water vapor. When air cools down, that water vapor condenses into a cloud and it starts to rain. So warm air, high water vapor capacity, cool air, low water vapor capacity. Big words for you, adiabatic heating and cooling. What this means is as air becomes more or less dense, its temperature changes. So if you take air and put pressure on it and shrink it down, so let's say you got your big box of air up here, you put pressure on it, you shrink it down, you shrink it down, basically you're taking those molecules and packing them closer together, which makes them warm up. So know that if you increase the pressure on an amount of air that is adiabatic heating, it will cause the air to heat up. If, let's say you've got a packet of air that gets warm and it rises up through the atmosphere, as it goes up through the atmosphere, the pressure will decrease on it, it's going to expand. As it expands, it will cool down. So that's adiabatic heating and cooling. Final property of air that you need to know about is latent heat release, which is a really interesting process where 
When air molecules, or not air molecules, when water vapor molecules cool down and condense into a cloud, they release heat, which makes sense because you know that as sun heats up, let's say we got a lake here, sun heats up our lake, those water molecules get all excited, they get hot, they start flying around, and they evaporate as water vapor. As they evaporate as water vapor, they take all of that heat with them. Then, when they cool down, they kind of slow down, condense back together, and as they slow down and condense back together, all that heat that they were holding on to is released out to the air. And like I said over here, air that warms up becomes less dense and rises. So this means that as clouds form, the formation of cloud causes more air to rise, which is gonna cause more clouds to form, which releases heat, which causes more air to rise and forms more clouds process we'll talk about a little bit later on. So make sure that you got those four properties of air in your back pocket. Tying this to our last slide of the day, which is kind of where it all wraps together into something known as a Hadley cell. And one of the major things that determines the climates of the earth is the way that air circulates around the earth. There are some major global wind patterns that determine a lot of climates. Right now, we're just going to focus on one of them, and that is called the Hadley cell, which basically brings together all of the qualities of air that we have just talked about. So we said that sun hits the earth most directly and warms up the equator the most. The equator of the earth is the hottest part of the earth. Now, because this area of the earth is really hot, like we just said, warm air rises. So at the equator, you've got like a river of air that is flowing up into the stratus or into the troposphere all the time. Warm air rising is just like a river of air flying straight up. Now, we also said that as air rises, pressure on it is decreased, so it goes through adiabatic cooling, which means it condenses to form clouds. And as it does that, all of these clouds are formed along the equator and it rains. This is why all of your rainforests are near the equator, because this area known as the ITCZ which is the International Tropic Convergence Zone. And this is basically where all the storms happen around the world. So air rises, it cools, it condenses, it rains down at the equator, and then that air that has just dropped all of its water starts to flow north and south. And as it form, flies north and south, it starts to cool down and sink towards the surface of the Earth. As it sinks towards the surface of the Earth, the pressure on it increases, which means that it goes through adiabatic heating and it warms up, and then it rushes across the surface of the Earth at about 30 degrees. Now, those areas at 30 degrees where that warm, dry air comes back down is where the deserts of the world exist. So this is why around the world you've got like tropical rainforests, and then next to them you've got deserts because at the ITCZ where the air is rising, dropping its rain, you get the rainforest, but then as that air dries out and sinks back down towards the earth and heats up, it's going to dry out the land that it moves across. And then it makes a full circle as it flows back to the equator to replace the air that is rising. And this is just a loop right here that will continue on and on and on. That is known as a Hadley cell. The major Hadley cells are between the equator, which is zero degrees and 30 degrees north and south. There is another Hadley cell between 30 and 60 degrees. And then there is a polar cell between 60 and the poles at 90 degrees. And I think that's all we got for today. I know that was a really dense video. Rewind it, take notes, fast forward it as you need. Make sure that you have got all of these qualities that determine the climate of an area together in your head. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.